My name is Kevin Hines, and I have a story to tell. In the year 2000, I tried to take my life. I jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. And I lived. Now, with my family and friends, I go around the world, sharing stories and creating stories of hope, healing, and recovery. I never thought in my life I could do things like this. This is just the beginning. Podcast episode 13 of Living Large, where you can catch it every Wednesday morning on Castbox. The app is in the App Store. Just download it. It is there exclusively at 6 a.m., followed by a YouTube posting at noon on my YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash Mark Donor. Make sure you guys hit that like button, that subscribe button, because today's guest is a very special one. Kevin Hines, welcome into the podcast. Hello. How you doing, man? I'm part of the donation. Now you are. Yeah. Yeah, our first interview. I actually met you for the first time in London. In London. Yes. At uh, the uh, KSI vs. Logan Paul fight. What were you there Manchester. for? Manchester. You were supporting Logan. Supporting the log. I call him log. Why? Shorten it. You know, it's simple. Log. Log. Because he's like a brick wall. Logster. And logs are strong. And he is. And you're strong. Let's talk about that. Why why are you so active in fitness? I work out, well, I was working out 16 times a day, 13-minute increments every day, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I I used to be near diabetic. I was over 275 pounds of pure fabulous. 275? 275. How tall are you? I'm I'm not tall. (laughs) I'm 5'7 and a quarter, which is a very tall 5'7. Yeah. Very tall 5'7. I'm a tall person. Anyway, um... And I got, I, I, I've been near diabetic twice in my life. And after I got a skin disease that caused me secondary burns from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head, bloody blisters throughout my entire body and excruciating physical pain for 30 weeks, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, feeling like needles are coming from my bones out of my skin, 24 hours a day. What was that, what was that caused from the sun? No. Well, let me explain. So, uh, my, medications that I take for mental health that I take very seriously that help me stay alive mentally because I have bipolar disorder poisoned my organs. Wow. And they caused my entire skin to erupt in burns all over my body, palms included. It was bad. Um, That doesn't sound fun. No, it wasn't fun. It was 30 weeks of excruciating pain, 24 hours a day. Wow. And I, I, I wanted to buckle. I wanted to fold. And I was like, no, I got this on lockdown. And Either this is going to get better, and the doctors were telling me, no, it's not. It's going to be like this for the rest of your life. And then I found something that helped me get rid of the burns and get rid of most of the pain. I still am in pain some days, and it's pretty bad, but it's not all day, every day, which would just bring me to tears at an airport, and people are like, what is wrong with that guy? Wow. Yeah, man. And it's hot water is the cure. (laughs) (laughs) Hot water every day. Kevin comes into the studio, and and I was like, hey, do you want a water? And he grabs his own little (laughs) bottle. He's like, no, I eat boiling hot. I drink boiling hot water. Why do you drink boiling hot water? Because it, it, a couple things. It's a good digestion tool. It's very, it helps smooth things. You know, you got to go, you got to go, right? Mm -hmm. So then it does that. But it's also a bodybuilding technique and a a, a weight loss technique. Uh, When the water is hot, you sweat more. When the water is hot, it, 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 it engages your metabolism, making it faster than it would if it wasn't. And when you consume at a rate of like four of these a day, it helps you stay fit to the best of your ability and feel good on the inside because it's so smooth. How did you, how did you drop, what do you weigh now? Like 170? No, 175? no, uh, uh, 164. So you've dropped over 100 and 
20 pounds since, almost. Since a while ago. Since yeah. a while ago. But yeah. how did that process look like? Uh, it was slow and up and down. <laughs> Were you, yeah, because cause that's something I struggle with, to be honest, is like going to the gym consistently and staying active. So you were 275 was was it all dietary and and obviously working out or was yeah, it Yeah man I was I was I, I was blind to myself about the food I was consuming and so one of the biggest things besides hot water that helped me get get in shape this time uh, cuz I've gone up and down you know I've, I had issues with my weight up fluctuating what really helped me this time was reading the book Genius Foods by Max Lugavere who's a friend of mine and uh, you know Dr Oz wrote his forward and and Max Lugavere is like the leading authority today in 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 non-inflammatory foods and inflammatory foods swell your brain and affect your brain function and affect things like mental health so a lot of the people out there who are dealing with bipolar disorder depression anxiety stress eating disorders and all these things a lot of that has to do with what they ingest and how it affects their brain and then their thinking. Mm -hmm. So with Max's book, I was able to like go, okay, if I eat non-inflammatory foods 90% of the day, 90% of the, of, of the time I'm eating, I am healing my body's mind. So you're talking to a guy who lives with extreme paranoid delusion, hallucinations, auditory and visual, severe depression, bringing me to suicidal thinking regularly, chronic thoughts of suicide. When I started eating non-inflammatory foods, my severe paranoia has dropped down to paranoias. Like when I would think like all the time that people were out to get me, trying to hurt me and trying to kill me mm -hmm. that aren't. But it, when, when you have that level of paranoia, it is absolutely petrifying. And, and, and you believe it to be fact and it destroys you and it destroys the people around you. But now I live with mild paranoia because of the food I'm eating. And when I live with severe depression where it was just crushing me, like just bringing me to a level where I'm like, I, I just I want to take my life all the time. You know, now it's like, okay, I get a depressed mood because I still have bipolar disorder. It's never going to go away. There's no cure. But now I I use the, the food I eat to help balance my brain along with the exercise, along with therapy and a great many other things that help keep me sane in the worst of times. Mm -hmm. And you have the shirt on, be here tomorrow. Uh, and for those of you guys that are listening, you're, you're one of 16 survivors, yeah? Actually, now it's, I'm one of, I'm, I was number 26 of 39 survivors off the Golden Gate Bridge. 98% of the people who attempt off that bridge are gone. Wow. So 2,000 people have died off the Golden Gate Bridge plus now. Some, uh, uh, the Marine Corner believes it's more like 3,000 or higher for all the bodies washed away to sea or eaten by fish to the bone, because uh, that's what happens. Uh, so let's just say 2,000 people have died. 1.8% of them have survived. That's about 39 individuals, three in the last nine weeks alone have survived. Have survived. Have survived. Wow. Five of us can walk, stand, and run. Wow. Yeah, we're called them. They, they call us the most exclusive survivors club in the world. We're in a book of the same name by Ben Sherwood. And you're coming up, this is the 18th year since you're Yeah, man. September 18 25th years. this year was 18 years since I jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. That's insane. And, 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 and you're, you're spreading a movement and, and I wanted to talk, talk to you and touch base on mental health. Cause it's something to be honest that I'm a little bit naive on the subject because it's hard for me to grasp what it is that you go through. So, so can you, can you talk a little bit about mental health and, and give someone that doesn't, I mean, obviously I, I deal with, you know, anxiety sometimes and I get depressed sometimes, but I wouldn't describe it on a level that you've described it. You know what I'm saying? Can you, can you help me understand what it is that you feel like you go through in your brain? Yeah. Let me help you, you and your viewers and your listeners understand that, 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 you know, we live in a society today, uh, that is manic. We live in a society where everything is uber efficient you know, you can go on your phone and you can get anything anywhere, anytime, mm -hmm. even love yep. or sex. <laughs> and, you know, not me. I'm married. I'm happy. Married. Not me. But anyway, my point is this. We live in a manic society where everything is moving at a fast pace, but our brains aren't necessarily meant to move that fast. And when I deal with mental health, I'm talking about like living with a depression so great that you believe you are worthless, have no value, and are a burden to everyone who loves you. And when you feel like that, when you feel like you are a burden, like you are hurting other people just by your pure existence, you come into a, a space in your mind where the pain is so great. I call it lethal emotional pain, right? That's what leads people to suicide, lethal emotional pain. You know, I think though, Mark, in order for you to like really understand how I got to the Golden Gate Bridge or how someone can get that depressed or that mm -hmm. mentally unstable, I think in my story, you have to know where I came from. I was born in squalor on 6th Street in a crack motel. I was born to a place with a concrete slab floor, barely a box spring for a mattress. 
kind of places you paid for by the hour. And if you didn't, you were out. And my birth mom and dad, I'm adopted. My birth mom and dad did whatever they had to do to pay by that hour, on that hour, however illegal. Mm-hmm. They did scored and sold drugs. And they, they would leave me and my brother unattended while they went to do score and sell drugs. How, how long? So uh, what age? First nine months of my life. Oh, wow. First nine months of my life, I was fed what mom and dad could steal, me and my brother. Wow. Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola, and sour milk was my diet. Um, and then what happened is, is one, one CD motel clerk was like, hey, this, this shit ain't cool. Let's get these kids out of here. And this is a guy that doesn't call the police. He's mm-hmm. already doing stuff he's not supposed to. He calls the police. Please come in with Child Protective Services. They take us away from our parents who loved us. They were mm-hmm. just sick. They had manic depression. They coped with drugs. Manic depression is now called bipolar disorder, the very okay. same brain disease I would develop. So I'm in this situation. I get taken out of it. I get placed in foster care, bounce around for nine months. I got a distended belly filled with liquid, bruised from the top of my sternum to the bottom of my abdomen from being malnourished. Um, and, and my brother does too. And then me and my brother are supposed to be adopted together. We both get bronchitis, he dies. Wow. You know? At what age? Um, you know, he was only he was only like nine, 10, 12 months older than me. Oh, wow. So like my brother, his name is Jordash, may rest in peace. They say he looked just like me with blonde curly hair. Can you see it? Anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, you know, he died. And, and I immediately developed a severe detachment disorder from reality mm-hmm. at nine months of age. And then I bounced around from home to home. But, but you know, he died, I got lucky. Patrick and Deborah Hines maybe their son. And they are mom and dad, and they gave me a beautiful life. But even though they gave me a beautiful life, a lo- filled with unconditional love, mm-hmm. didn't matter. I got to 17 and a half and my fucking brain broke. Everything fell apart. I was on stage when it happened. I, I was a theater kid. Oh, okay. Um, I was playing Gatch and How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. I was wearing my, my dad's old suits and ties. And, and I'm on stage and I begin to believe for the first time I have extreme paranoid delusion for the first time ever. I, I look out into the 1200 person audience, it was packed. And I, I, I thought they were all there to kill me. Just that I had been unraveling. I had been falling apart mentally, but I hadn't been telling anybody. Mm-hmm. And if I'm, if I'm honest, I had, I had heard voices since fourth grade, but never told anybody. What do you, how does a fourth grader tell their parents they hear voices that are not their right. conscience, right. you know? And I'm on that stage and I run off and I run to the lobby and, and, and John Fennell, who's in my movie, Suicide, The Ripple Effect, John Fennell was a theater director. He was like a failed actor turned high school thespian director, but he was really good. He was the best teacher I ever had. He meets me in the lobby and he goes, Heinz, can you please finish the performance? It's not even an intermission yet. What are you doing? And I couldn't speak. I couldn't get out three words in a row that made sense. He called my mom. Mom comes to pick me up. I'll never forget the way she looked at me. I'll never forget the look in her eyes unadulterated fear because she could see the depths of insanity brewing in mine. And I went to see my first psychiatrist. And this guy was on methamphetamines the entire time he treated me and his other patients. He was one of the best in the field, you know? And he was sick. He had substance use disorder like my mom and dad, my birth mom and dad. The psychiatrist you were going to? The psychiatrist I was going to, one of the best in the field. He was sick. He was having his own pain. Lost a lot of patients to suicide. Would lose his license, his job, and then he would take his life. Wow. He would be the second person of seven people that I grew to really care about, some of who I loved, who would die by suicide, the first being John Fennell, my theater director. So, like, I've, I've been, my whole life's been riddled with substance use disorder and, and mental illness and suicide. I've lost seven people I love. My high school wrestling partner, Marty, may you rest in peace, homie. You know, it, it's followed me. And in the year 2000, in September, I was like, I was on this wild ride of mania. Every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I'd skyrocket into this euphoric natural high that, that was, uh, it was amazing. It was, you know, you could do anything. You could be anyone. I would go and I would, uh, <laughs> I ran, I, I, I lobbied to be the president of the United States at 18 in my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. People were like, get away from me. Like, <laughs> just, we're not signing your petition, you know. But, um, you know, I got, to, I got to September 2000 and the, the weight, the pure weight of the, of, of the emotional pain was too great. And I, 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 I folded. I, I said, I lost my freaking phone there. <laughs> All good. Kevin Hines, what in the hell? Good Lord, it's Mark Donor's podcast. <laughs> God, do you know what you're doing? You know, I sat in my room 
on September 24th writing that note. Only 20% of people who died by suicide actually wrote a note. I wrote that note. Mom, I love you, but you're not always right. Dad, I love you, but stop, uh, you know, stop bringing the office home. This doesn't work. I said to my little brother, he wanted to be a DJ. He was making mixed cassette tapes. Was he adopted as well? Or was yeah, he, yeah. Okay. Different family. Adopted. Okay. Uh, we, we, three kids, three separate families, different races in one house. Uh-huh. And my, my, I'm mixed. My brother's black. My sister's white. And and I said, Joe, I said to my brother, you'd be a household name, you know? And my sister wanted to make films. I said, you got this. Go get it, you know? I said to my best friend, Jake Lewis at the time, it's not you. I said, I said, I said to my best friend, Jake Lewis, uh, you'll find another best friend. It's not how it works. Mm-hmm. I said to my girlfriend slash ex-girlfriend at the time. It was debatable. I said, it, it's not you, it's me. And I put the note in my shoulder bag and the shoulder bag by the door. And at, at, at six in the morning, I entered my dad's room. And he, he he wears a CPAP machine. He woke up and he goes, Kevin, what's wrong? He had known of my like unwell behavior and he known I was diagnosed. He knew I was on meds. I said, nothing, dad. I just want to tell you that I love you. I wanted to tell him. But as I wanted to tell my dad the absolute truth that I was suicidal and that I was going to go to the Golden Gate Bridge and die, a voice in my head said, be quiet, Kevin. This is inevitable. And I listened. And it led me to take a bus to the Golden Gate, crying the entire time, begging myself to tell the one man who loved me the most in the world on the phone that I was sick. I needed help. But I couldn't. Because as I was wanting to tell someone of my pain, Mm -hmm. the voices were screaming in my head that I had to die. And it wasn't so much that I wanted to die. I believed I had to. What do you do when that happens? And you've never experienced it before. And you have no one to talk to about it or you feel you have no one to talk to about it. Anyway, it it led me to be on that rail. And, um, this woman approaches me from my left and she had blonde curly hair and she's beautiful and and she goes, Vil, you take my picture? And that's when I, I was like, nobody cares. Mm-hmm. I think today she was actually trying to reach me. She was the only person that engaged, that interacted, that tried to connect. I didn't see it. And the voices won that day. Where 2,000 people have died, I got to live. And I'm grateful for every millisecond I get to walk and breathe because I almost couldn't. Like I I hit that water 225 feet, 25 stories, 75 miles an hour in four seconds you hit that water. And the impact reverberated through my legs and shattered my T12, L1, and L2. They just popped and splintered inside me. And I temporarily lost use of my legs. I went down 70 feet beneath the water surface and I opened my eyes and all I wanted to do was live. I swam 70 feet with one breath without the use of my legs as fast as I could, thinking the entire time, if I die here, no one will ever know I didn't want to. And that's what drove me. And in the water, I come above the water and I keep going down. I can't stay afloat. My boots are waterlogged. It's wearing long sleeve clothes, cargo pants. I couldn't stay above water. I kept going down. And I come up one more time. And as I come up and spit out salt water, I think, I'm going to die today. And no one's going to know all I wanted to do was live. And that is when something began to circle beneath me. It was large and very slimy and very alive. And I thought, you got to be kidding me. I didn't die off the Golden Gate Bridge and a shark is going to eat me. (laughs) And I just, I accepted it. I'm going to die by a shark bite. But it wasn't a shark just kept circling faster and faster beneath me. No longer was I waiting in the water. I'm lying on top of it being kept buoyant by this thing. Was it like hitting you? It was, it was bumping me up. I was no longer swimming. I'm lying on my back being kept afloat by this thing thinking, when is it going to bite me? I go on a show called Primetime Live on ABC with John Quinones. He does that show, what would you do? On the show, I say, I thought there was a shark in the water beneath me. People wrote into the show from all over the world. One man's letter stuck out of all the rest. His name was Morgan McWard. Shout out, Morgan. He was from Las Vegas, Nevada. He was on the bridge that day with his mother. He was next to me when I jumped. He wrote to me, Kevin, I'm so very glad you're alive. I was standing less than two feet away from you when you jumped. It's haunted me until right now watching this show because no one would ever tell me whether you lived or died. By the way, Kevin, 
there was no shark, but there was a sea lion. And the people above believed it to be keeping you afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind you. And that's why Herbert is right on my shirt. Wow. Yeah. That's why right. do you call him Herbert? I named him that day. Herbert. Herbert. It was either Herbert or Mortimer, and I went with Herbert. I like that. Yeah, man. I wouldn't have known what that was. I should have asked. It's all good. And, and, and it's led you, and I'm glad you're alive. I'm glad you're here. Thank you, bro. Because you've transformed this into a positive. Yeah. Be here tomorrow is yeah. what you say. You have your documentary coming out. Uh, the documentary is, the docu-series is coming Docu-series. Out. Yeah, we're, we're, we're working on that right now. The documentary is out, Suicide the Ripple Effect, at suicidetherippleeffect.com. All around the world, it's been seen by 35,000 people in the last few months. It's been seen in 20 different countries. It's a beautiful film about recovery from pain. And and how how have you, from being so down, being thinking the world's against you, and being in your own head, how have you transformed that into, because you're such a positive light now, you know what I'm saying? You're always happy. Well, you, you project it, you know what I'm saying? I know I'm sure you talk about, you still deal with the same struggles. There's a lot of pain. But how do you project your positivity? How do you project the happiness? How do you project the be here tomorrow to not only yourself, but to other people that are struggling with mental health? One thing I don't do, I mean, I project that certainly a lot of the time, but when I, I do post on social media when I'm in pain. Okay. I do share, I share the pain. Not a lot of people do that these days. I, when, I, when, I, when I'm going through depression and I get past it, I'll write about what it was like and how I got past it, how, how I broke free from, from the pain. Because even though with this new diet and this, and this new lifestyle, I'm, I'm feeling much better, I still get hit with depression, paranoia, delusions, mania, psychosis. And when that happens, I have a support network in my life that let like my wife, Margaret, mm-hmm. and my father, Patrick, and some other folks, and, and they really, you know, I can tell them anything. I can tell them anything. They're not going to judge me. So when I go through it, I go through it sometimes publicly and I just tell the truth. And when I get through it, I'm like, hey, we got this. We, as in like, you got your donation. Like I've got mm-hmm. the Peter Mall folks all around the world who, who follow that mantra. And I've got people that write to me and say, this helps keep me here one day at a time. Every day I go to myself, just be here tomorrow and get to tomorrow and then take it from there. Because there are so many people, Mark, that live with chronic thoughts of suicide. They're adding it to the DSM-6, which is the diagnostic tool for mental health in, in, in the world. And, and, and they're adding chronic thoughts of suicide as its own disease, which is terrifying. Mm-hmm. Our children are living with a lack of resilience in their lives today because we're not teaching them how to cope with pain. We're teaching them how to be cool on these things. And I was going to talk about that because I think what I've heard is depression's reached an all-time high. And I think a lot of it has to do with social media, to be honest. It's like we we sit, we compare ourselves to what other people have, what other people look like, what their lifestyles look like. But it's like you could be at a low point in your life, but you're looking at someone's Instagram, which is a highlight reel with all the highs in their life. You know what I'm saying? Like I like to project the happiness and the positivity in the life that I live, but I obviously deal with days where I'm not happy. I, but I don't want to put that out in the world. But, you know, I like that you do talk about the days that you're not happy. So people do understand, look, I, I do project all this positivity, this happiness, but I still struggle. And that's, I think that's important. You know what I'm saying? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you approach people that are, are dealing with mental health? Or, you know, because you've dealt with you, you mentioned seven people in your life have committed suicide. And, uh, I'm sorry, died by suicide. Thank you for that. Yeah, yes. we say died by suicide because committing sounds like they're committing a crime or they're right. bad people, but really they're di- like your brain is an organ just like every other organ in the body. Right, right. Everything can get diseased, you know? Right. Um, how do you, did, did they, there were there signals there? How do you approach someone and say, look, are you okay? How do you, without being, you know, what if there is no issue? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like approaching someone where with mental disorder or anorexia and be like, look, and without making them insulted, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think it's a matter of how you look at them and how you listen to understand, but not to, not to respond. So I think like when you see someone who you know is in pain, whether you can visibly see the pain on their body, the form of their body, or through their eyes and you see they're in pain, approaching anyone in that situation, physical, mental, emotional pain and saying, hey, you know, I don't want to intrude but I gotta be honest with you. I care about you and I'm really worried about you. I think you're going through something that you're not talking about and I'd like to be there for you. Compassionate eyes, non-judgmental. And then when you ask, you wanna ask someone who you think, who you think is suicidal, you wanna ask them directly. Mm-hmm. 
are you suicidal and have you ever made plans to take your life? People's myth is that that put the thought in their mind when they're not thinking about it. That's not what happens. If they're not thinking about it, they're going to look at you sideways and go, get away from me. And I've had that happen. But if they are thinking about it, you've just given them permission to tell the truth about the greatest pain in their entire life. And often, man, like statistically speaking, when people ask that question, most people are truthful. Mm -hmm. And then you get an opportunity to change and potentially save a life. I was on Market Street in San Francisco uh, between, between Civic Center and Embarcadero. So Civic Center and Market Street in San Francisco is the gutter. It's, 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 it's dilapidated. It's filled with homeless individuals, people without homes, and people who are on drugs. And, and, and Embarcadero is opulence. It's people in five ten thousand $10,000 suits walking around, right. and girls in high, high, Jimmy Choo's and all that. And, and, and in between there, I'm walking, and I'm going to a job interview. And um, living on social security disability, trying to get back into the world, you know, and I'm going and I see in the distance a, a, a man who's clearly without a home and he's got a blanket over him and blood is quickly pouring out from underneath the blanket, like a lot of it. And I watch all these opulent type people look at him and step over him and continue. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, and I, and I ran over there. I called the police. I lifted up the blanket. He's been stabbed. He's, he's bleeding out. I waited for the, the ambulance to get there. They took him. I don't know what happened to him. Mm -hmm. God, I hope he's alive. But I watched at least six people look at the blood and keep going. If that is the society we live in, yeah, that is a problem. Yeah. So my point, Mark, to, to bring it back to your question, when you see someone in potential lethal emotional pain, I don't care if you don't know them from Adam. I don't care if you don't love them. I don't care if you don't like them. Put your arm around them and say, I got you. I don't know you, but I got you and I care because you're human and so am I. And I'm going to be here for you. And you don't have to, to do the things you're thinking about. And I want to help you get to a safe place. Yeah, I agree. I, know, I mean, you see a lot of people struggling on the streets, uh, obviously, and you don't even think twice. You just, you know, go about your day, especially in Hollywood, you know, even coming here, you see hundreds of them in Skid Row and it's, it's bad. It's definitely not, it's not something you want to see at all. Um, but I want to talk about how have you, so what, what's your movement right now with Be Here Tomorrow? So Be Here Tomorrow is a movement that we moved from, you know, like Facebook and Instagram to now YouTube and 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 uh, we got the YouTube vlog going that was inspired by Logan and, Lo and all that Logan's doing to to make kids smile, you know. And, and I wanted to find a way, you know. I, I'm new at this game. I'm learning. Right, and, right. And you know the 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 Beater Mall movement is something that has been turned into shirts in Japan and China, and people are like taking it and embracing it all over the world. Is that something you? came up with? Yeah, man. Be here tomorrow? Yeah, I did, yeah. Okay. I, I, I had this, you know, I, 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 I had heard the saying mm -hmm. and I was like, man, that's got to be on a shirt and that's got to be a, a worldwide movement. We made this, we, 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 we made a song with this cat AV, who's this rapper who made the song Beer Tomorrow for the film Suicide, The Ripple Effect. It's at the end of the movie. It's available online. It's a beautiful song about surviving suicidal pain and it, it, it's gorgeous and it inspires people when people hear it to change their lives and people write in like I have, I have these cats like now that now we, uh, my a friend of mine uh, named Mary, contra, contrary Mary on Instagram, uh, made this beard of maw tattoo that she got. And now all these other kids are getting it. And it's the sea, it's the sea lion. It's Herbert. It's my sea lion, just like this with these beautiful flowers painted on the inside and this beautiful script beard of maw. And people are getting it tattooed on their arms and their legs. And it's, it's amazing. It's a wonderful thing because people attach to it and they let it save them every day, one day at a time. It's gorgeous, mm -hmm. you know? That's amazing. Are you go, do you go, I see you always talking in front of people. What is that? Is that like, motive, is that like, do you go to schools? Do you go to conferences? What is that like? All of the above. Like I go to schools, conferences, military, law enforcement. I go all around the world, probably 320 days a year telling this story. Okay. And, and I do it in a way that is safe messaged, that is uh, transformative. And my wife, Margaret, uh, uh, she, she actually uh, commissioned a white paper that's coming out soon on how uh, the way I tell my story has a transformative effect on the brain scientifically to change and save lives. 
So we got a white paper that's done by some of the best suicidologists in the field, people that study prevention. And they determined that the, the keywords I use and the way I tell the story and the way I formulate the story with the aspect of recovery. So I do talk about the method, which some people don't like, but I talk about the method to then talk about how I live in recovery, how I stay in recovery, and how I stay alive with suicidal thoughts that are chronic. Do you, to, to stay alive, to control your thoughts, do you rely on yourself or do you rely on support system, your wife, Margaret, your dad, your friends, your family? Who do you rely on the most? Faith, family, and friends. So I have a faith in a higher power. I'm not going to push that on anybody. That's my uh -huh. prerogative. I always have. I only lost it the day I went off the Golden Gate Bridge. I found it on the way down and I was praying. And he <laughs> saved my life. So, you know, the sea line, Herbert's for real. You yeah. know? So, so, so I have a faith that's strong and I have a family that's strong. And, and, and here's the thing. A lot of people don't have that. You know, your mom and dad, I see them on your vlogs. They're beautiful people. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and we're lucky to have that kind right. of mom and dad, you know, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people have abusive and neglectful moms and dads or no moms and dads at all or one of the two. And, you know, I travel around the world trying to help people who don't have it all, who don't have that support network. I mean, find reasons to support themselves, find ways to be resilient as hell in the face of pain. And that's, that's the Beard of Mar movement. It's like, we can do this together. We can fight the pain in spite of the pain to thrive one day at a time. And we got this on lockdown. My support network is large, it's vast, but I build it every day. Mm -hmm. Like now you and me, yeah, we're friends for life, homie. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah I, at least I hope so. No, you know? I, love, I love the fact, like, I'll get random texts from Kevin all the time. <laughs> just like a video of him, like, yo, like hyped as <laughs> hyped to tell, like yeah, just man. like I love you guys. I was thinking about you today. God yeah, dang it. <laughs> I love that. I think that's important to to be there for people, you know, so so that they feel love, so that they like everyone deserves to have someone in their corner. You know what I'm saying? And I think ever, if you ever if you ever had a severe mental health crisis, the first thing you fucking do is call me. Call Kevin Hines. I'll be on a I'll his be on phone a, number. Is, <laughs> I'll be on a plane in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. And that's amazing. That's an amazing quality about you because not, not a lot of people, I know some people that have, you know, they've reached out and people just didn't care. You know what I'm saying? And that's the worst thing in the world. Um, but my myself, you know, I, I really haven't dealt with, you know, what you have dealt with. I have in high school, I think one person that I knew, I didn't know them. I just knew of them. I took their own life. Um, and then to be honest, that's kind of the only, you know, and I was, I feel like I, it was young, I was young, you know what I'm saying? And I didn't really understand or grasp it. It was like, I don't think it's talked about a lot. What do you, what do you think about that? Like brought to the attention that it is okay to feel this way. You know, it is okay to talk to someone to get help rather than feeling like you said that you're a burden. You know what I'm saying? Do you think that it should be taught in school? Do you think that people should learn about it? So, so right now, New York City uh, and the five boroughs have mandated suicide prevention education and mental health education from third grade on up. Wow, that's great. Hell yeah. And my wife and I and our Kevin and Margaret Hines Foundation are getting behind that movement and to do everything we can to help propel that across the country. Um, because I've always said that kids from fourth grade on and now they're doing third grade, but it's great. I said, kids from fourth grade on, I've, I've been a big proponent of this, should be educated in mental health, resilience in the face of pain, and coping strategies for that pain. Because they're not, we live in a society where more 14 to 18 year olds die by, more, 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 more 14 to 18 year olds die from suicide than lung disease, cancer, HIV and AIDS and heart disease combined. Right. I think I read something because I was doing a little research before this, that 12 to 26, the leading, like the second leading cause of death. Second leading cause of death. Is suicide. And it's the first leading cause of death among a certain age of young, young ladies these days. Does it, does it have something to do with brain development? Does it have- It has a lot to do being, with brain being, development. You know, young. Our brains aren't fully developed till 25. Right. And so when you face pain and you're not prepared for it, you, you fold. Yeah. You go, I can't, I can't do this. I can't live with this pain. It's too great. But there's so much more to live for. There's so much more to live for. Yeah. Listen, think about it like this, all right? I tell kids all over the world that you are intended to be here until your natural end. Mm -hmm. And I ask them to look into my brown eyes. You got brown eyes. I got brown eyes. I ask them to look <laughs> into my brown eyes 
and hear this. Think of all the children who never make it past the womb. Mm -hmm. My wife and I know that pain. We've had a miscarriage. Eight weeks, Jack Ryan lived and no more. He was not intended to be here in, in, in his physical form. You are. The kids in my audiences are for the simple fact that I can see your eyes and you're physically here. Mm -hmm. You're meant to be here. And then, okay, that's not enough. So you got to go, okay, how can I help you stay here when you have that lethal emotional pain? What can I do to inspire you to change your life today, to augment your destiny, to do the work for your mental health, to change every aspect of your life so you can survive and thrive every day? And so I give them tools like, like the fact that I exercise multiple times a day, 23 minutes of rigorous exercise leads to 12 hours of better mood. If you're physically capable and you're not doing it, let's go. You know? Yeah, I need to do that. There we go. See, <laughs> just 23 minutes a day. Because that's a big issue too. Like I feel like a lot of people, you know, you get out of shape and then you sit and like, like I said, you look at Instagram, you see all these people in shape. I'm motivated by it, but a lot of people are like, damn, like if they look at themselves in the mirror and then they struggle and that can weigh on you mentally. You know what I'm saying? It, it does sometimes to me because when I lose or when I put on some weight, I'm like, damn, I'm not happy with the way I look. I'm going to keep my shirt on. <laughs> Comparison is the thief of joy. Right. Right. So if we compare ourselves to those who are successful, we'll never be fulfilled. But if we strive to be life skilled success, forget monetary success. That that stuff is useless for the right, birds, right? right? Yeah. Life skill success means that you are, if you're physically capable, because some people aren't lucky enough to be so, they're lucky. They're just they're they they go to things that they they can't get up and get to the ground and get moving. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you're physically capable, exercising a couple of times a day, 23 minutes a day, who, who doesn't have 23 minutes? Right. Shoot, do it for a minute a day. The University of Columbia just came out with a study saying one minute of exercise a day, rigorous, nonstop, one minute. Every day for nine months, you'll be in shape if, wow. you, if you eat well. Yeah, if you eat well. Yeah. See? So, okay. So, so, so maybe not 23. Do one minute a day. All right. Exercise. Eat healthy. Most foods, most days. Educate yourself as to any diagnosis you have. I mean, I mean, go to the to the walls, like read every publication on the disease they say you have, even if you don't believe it, so you know how to defeat the pain, right? Mm -hmm. Every therapeutic, every therapy that's based on your disease that is reputable and proven, get at it, you know? Exercise, eat healthy, educate. Use coping strategies that you love to feel better when you're in pain. Like when you're in pain, draw that stuff, write it down, uh, paint it, you know, go to the gym, whatever your coping strategy is that makes sense for you, right? And then, And then, you know, I refrain from drugs and alcohol. My biological parents died of drugs. There's no way I'm touching drugs. But I've been drank until blackout many a time while on psychotropic medication in the past, and it could have killed me. I haven't had a sip of alcohol since I was 21. That's a decision, a cognitive decision based on my parents' past that I don't want to follow, right? So refraining from drugs and alcohol, eating, exercising, educating. And then what I do is I, I make sure I do... Uh, 10 more things that help me and benefit me to stay mentally stable to the best of my ability, especially when I'm hurting mentally. Because if I don't do these things, Mark, I won't be here. I won't be here tomorrow. And I have to. I told you out there, I got people that write to me say, if you're not here, I'm not here. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 a heavy weight, but I'm ready to carry that weight. Right. I'm ready. Let's go. I feel like you've had such a difficult life, but it's so cool to see you positive and, and you've been through so much. And can I ask you like a personal... So you said that you binge drank when you're 21, but that was... And before, after, 16 to 21, I binge drank. Why did you resort to that after surviving when you said that... Well, I survived at 19. At 19, right. 19. And then and then I drank up until I was 21. So so what led you to do that? Because you mentioned that you were thankful, you know what I'm saying? I, w- I was thankful for surviving. And I went you know, I went from a, a wheelchair to a walk on a back brace, back brace and a cane, and then, and then uh, able-bodied. Um, but, but I still... I still wanted to be a kid, uh-huh. you know, and, and and when I physically was better, I wasn't always mentally better. I, I was going through the motions, and um, and I and I I drank to escape, mm-hmm. and I drank because of the darkness in my mind. And at 21, what happened was I got so drunk at a party in Chico. Uh, they, they party Chico oh, parties. Oh my good lord! <laughs> I got so drunk at a party in Chico. Uh, and I was like, you know, I had like two bottles of like my own stuff and I was the only one who was 21. So I bought for everybody. And, <laughs> don't do and, that. And no, you're no, no, don't do that. Don't. And so all these girls were like, oh, let me have a sip. And I was like, no, it's all for me. And, <laughs> and I just downed it and I'm spilling it all over myself. And like no girl play that day. It was like, they were like, get away from me, dude. Yeah. But, but I got so sick. I was sick for like the next five days. I, it was, it was near alcohol poisoning, if not alcohol oh, yeah. poisoning. And, 
And that'll and, make you not want to oh, drink man. ever again. And I woke up, I woke up and I was like, I'm done. I'm never going to touch it again. And I never did. And it was a bold move. I don't recommend that kind of removal from alcohol when you're drinking it regularly because that can cause depression. Mm-hmm. But I do recommend tapering off and finding right. a way to do something different. I think, yeah, someone told me that being an alcoholic, you can't quit cold turkey. If you quit cold turkey, you could you die. You Your could body die. can Your go into body shock. Your body can collapse. It, you know, it's yeah. very dangerous. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Just don't drink, okay? Just, <laughs> you know, have a have a glass of wine f- for dinner or something, but, you know, try to stay, <laughs> try to stay away from the binge drinking. Yeah. Um, wow. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Anything you'd like to say to people listening? You know, I think that, you know, I think that people who, specifically you guys out there who have been diagnosed with a mental illness, is that something you're born with, or uh, is it something that's it's developed? It's something they think is genetic. They think they're, they think they're, they think it's it's a it's a part of your your ancestry, and that it's in it's in the brain, and um and it's derived from the brain. And it, it you know, listen, if if you're out there and you are hurting mentally and you're not talking about it, you're burying it. I, people off. I silenced my pain, Mark, for a long time. If people on your podcast are going to learn anything from me today, anything at all. When you, when you put these headphones down or those earbuds out of your ear or you stop watching, consider this. You're intended to be here until your natural end. And if you're silencing your pain, your pain is valid. Your pain is worthy of my time and Mark's and others. And your pain matters because you do. When you silence your pain, it bubbles and it festers and it grows and then it explodes. Rage, violence, aggression, substance mm-hmm. use disorder, suicidal thoughts, ideas, or actions. When you leave this podcast today, practice never again silencing your pain. Tell the truth about it to someone, anyone willing to hear your pain, anyone willing to empathize with your struggle. You're not alone. We love you. We care about you. And suicide is never the solution to your problems. It is the problem. You got this on lockdown. You just don't know it. And you can defeat this pain one day at a time to be the greatest you you ever experienced, but you got to be here to get there in the first place. I would have missed the love of my life. Margaret Hines would never have met me. I would have never met her. And I would not have been completely fulfilled in my life because that's what she's done for me. She saved my life on more times I can count on my hands and toes. And that's not to brag about my love life. That's just, that's just to say thank you, you know? Can I tell you real quick, the story of how I met Margaret. Yeah, absolutely. This yeah. is like, this is my favorite story. And, it, and, it, and then, you know, it's a story of hope. Like I was in my third of seven psych ward stays in 11 years. Uh, the first three were involuntary, forced in against my will, right? In that third psych ward stay, a couple things happened. My uncle George came to see me. He was my favorite uncle on my mom's side. He's a big guy, big belly, and walked kind of like a broken penguin. <laughs> He wasn't a penguin enthusiast or anything. He just, he just had sciatica in both knees and it was painful. <laughs> Shout out to Uncle George. Uncle George. <laughs> Uncle George would drive from six hours away in Arnold, California to come see me in every psych ward. That's love. Mm-hmm. He would also drive six hours away to make fun of me in front of my friends for an hour, but it's also love. <laughs> and one day he comes in and he's got this rolled up magazine in his left hand and he's like gripping it, you know. And he goes, Kevin, your family can help you until we are blue in the face. But until and when you take 100% responsibility, young man, for the fact that you have this disease and you fight it tooth and nail every day, kid, ain't nothing going to change. You'll be in and out of these places for the rest of your life. Is that what you want? I said, no, Uncle George. He dropped that magazine like a mic drop on the table and he got up and left. As he was leaving, he passed a 67-year-old Spanish woman named Gloria in the hallway. He turned to her, he goes, you want to be like this, Kevin? She was arguably going to be in there for the rest of her life. There was no getting 67-year-old Gloria back from Mm -hmm. her insanity. I said, no, Uncle George. He said, well, get it together, kid. We're counting on you. And he left. I literally yelled, you're not my favorite uncle anymore. But he's gone. And I picked up the magazine. It was a Time Magazine article on bipolar disorder, depression, and mental illness, and how to defeat it with regimen and routine. None of my doctors ever told me that was a good idea. So I read the article read it twice. I'm in that hospital. It was the first time I was near diabetic. I was well overweight. That was when I was like 275. And I look in the mirror and I'm like, I got to change this, man. 
So I shaved all the hair off my head. I had a 16 inch beard jutting off my face. I had an afro out to here. So fiery red. It was like, it was massive. <laughs> so I, sh- I shaved all, I shaved everything. I never quite grew it back the way it was. And I, I realized I was a high school wrestling champion at the varsity level. I need to put my body to the ground. I need to get to work. And I did. Every day, every moment I wasn't in therapy, I was exercising in that psych ward. I go to the nurse's station. She's like, Kevin, listen, we got this nutritionist here. She, she has something to say about your food long. So she's like, listen, Kevin, you should probably stop eating four unhealthy meals per one meal a day. I said, yeah. that's sound advice. And I started eating healthier foods, non-inflammatory foods for the first time. And, and, and I would be up and down later, but anyway. So I start eating well. I start exercising every day, multiple times a day. I'm feeling better. Right? And then I go to the nurse's station. I'm like, listen, I'm an insomniac. I can't sleep. What can you do for me? They're like, we got pills for you. I said, no, no, no. I'm taking the pills you're giving me for psychosis 100% of the time with 100% accuracy like I'm supposed to. Give me something natural for my sleep, right? So they go, okay, Kevin, we got you covered. Uh, A nurse named Jane, she's from New Zealand, uh, red hair, you know, freckles, beautiful girl. She goes... Kevin, here. And she hands me a $2.99 CD player from Walgreens and three CDs. Whale, ocean, rainforest noise is proven through music therapy to alter brain waves and brain patterns to help sleep function. I thought it was nonsense. Mm-hmm. I started doing it. I started to sleep. When you start sleeping, sleeping, non-sleep, not sleeping leads to psychosis by itself. Mm-hmm. Add that to bipolar sort of chaos. So I'm sleeping, I'm eating, I'm exercising, I'm doing it all. And then I'm in therapy for the first time being honest in therapy. Just putting it all out there, telling everything I need to tell to get to the root of the problem. And I'm feeling better. I'm in that psych ward. And one day, I'm in there for two months because none of my family or friends would house me. They needed me to get well on my own. I got it. I'd hurt them for too long. So uh, this kid comes in on a gurney one day, 19 years old and catatonic. He can't move and he can't talk. What does catatonic mean? Can't move, can't talk, oh, okay. can't, can't do anything. He's non-function. He's, he's immobile. They would sit him down every... every um, Every hospital, every, every every breakfast, lunch, dinner, sit him down in a wheelchair and they'd sit him at a table and they'd bring him his tray of food. He can't eat it. It would sit there for an hour. It made me sick. I'm feeling better. I was like, how can I help this kid? So I went and I sat next to him across from him and I said, I just told him stories. You know, I'd learned how to tell stories in A with my, my uncle, Kevin Joseph Ryan, my, the patriarch of our family. May he rest in peace. He, he was 30 years drunk and 30 years sober. And I went to his last 10 chips. I learned how to tell stories in AA. So I'm in there. With, with the kid in the hospital and I'm just telling stories. And one day, two weeks into our stay, his stay, he moves. He goes like this, geez, man, you talk too much. Leave me alone. And I jumped <laughs> up and did like this happy dance. People were clapping and, and, uh, and I got him out of his catatonia. That was my goal. Why couldn't he talk? Uh, methamphetamines and another drug. He oh, had, he had okay. a, over, a massive overdose and he had been doing illicit drugs since he was 13. Wow. Like I said, it, Followed me my whole life. And so I get the kid talking again, but he doesn't want anything to do with me. Yeah. But the thing about this kid, he was special. Every single day without fail, 15 to 22 people who loved him would come to see him in a psych ward. Mark, nobody comes to see you in a psych ward, Mm -hmm. right? This kid had an entourage. When he was out of his catatonia, they would put their hands on the wired glass in the waiting room. He would put his hand on the other side. It was beautiful. Filipino, Spanish, American family. And one day... I have finagled my way into volunteering for the psych ward I was staying in, which is illegal. I was in the psych ward and I went to my case manager, Jana from Brooklyn. I said, Jana, give me a job. And she goes, what now? I said, Jana, you got me in here doing 10 forms of therapy. Give me one form of therapy and give me a job. I need something productive to do. I'm bored. And she goes, no, that's (laughs) highly unethical, probably illegal. That's not going to happen, Kevin. I said, Jana, well, can I have a hug? And she goes, what? I said, 23 second hugs release oxytocin in the brain that make you feel better. It's in the magazine. And she goes, get away from me. (laughs) And then the next day, like a blessing from the heavens above, Jana goes on vacation. And the new new case manager comes in. This lady was a total 1960s San Franciscan hippie. She had seen, done, and been to it all. She had this salt and pepper hair out to here that was curly fried. She had a lay of flowers around her neck that she'd made from herself, from her garden every morning, a flower (laughs) in her right ear and tie-dye shirts on every day. She claimed her different was the same shirt. And I go to her, I said, give me a job. And she goes, that sounds like a lovely idea. What can we have you do? And they should have never, Mark, let this woman alone in a psych ward nurse's station. She was dangerous. She walks back, grabs a giant green binder amongst 22 other giant green binders and goes, I know what you can do. You can file these. I said, what are they? And she goes, patient binders. Mark, do you know anything about HIPAA privacy laws? I'm sure you can't share them. <laughs> you can't share. You, know, you, yeah. can't, you can't share. Bind, you can't let a non 
hospital yeah, worker yeah. read those files. So she goes, just do it alphabetically and don't look at the details. <laughs> so I did it. I read through them. I, I didn't read through them. I, uh, I didn't look at most of the details. I, 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 I filed them. I filed yeah, them. Yeah. My paperwork got it done. Gives me my next job. Clean out the giveaway clothes closet. When you leave the hospital, you got something nice to wear. So I clean out the giveaway clothes closet. I box bin, label everything. Everyone in there is wearing hospital gown, hospital pants, hospital slippers. I come out of the closet, Mark. You, I come out of the closet <laughs> with a Ralph Lauren double-breasted polo suit and a 70s yellow flared collar like some kind of gangster who owned the place. <laughs> and I walk up to the nurse station. I grab a you know, five-finger discount, a clipboard yeah. notebook and pen, and I get to work. Leonardo, the Ninja Turtle, is looking good. <laughs> I'm the official hospital documentee. I'm giving myself my next seven jobs. I go up to the nurse station. I grab the microphone. It was like, it was like one of those... Uh, a fight microphones, you know, it's one of those big handle ones. So I grab it and I do the afternoon visiting hour announcements and I, I basically did it like, a, like an announcer, like I rhymed them, you know. And I get a tap on my left shoulder and I turn around and there she was. Her name was Margaret. Her eyes were almond brown, sexy and cool and I was done. I said to myself in my head, I'm going to marry her. And Mark, I never knew anything more my entire life. And she looks at me and I said, and she says, excuse me, do you work here? And I was like, I'm a volunteer. <laughs> and the whole staff is looking at me like this little, you know, yeah. but they didn't say anything. And I, and she goes, oh, okay. I'm looking for my cousin. His name is, it was that kid. Wait, really? Huh? Yeah. So I, this was her first time seeing him. Everyone else had seen him every day. This was the first time she was coming in. And so I put my hand on the small of her back and her elbow and I glided her there like a goofball. And she goes later, she's like, that was just creepy. <laughs> and I get her to the room and the kid sees me. I duck out into the hallway. And I hear her say, your nursing staff is so nice. <laughs> and then the kid goes, that guy, that guy is a nutball. That guy jumps off bridges. Wow. Don't talk to that guy. And I literally ran in there and I was like, excuse me. It was one bridge. One. one. <laughs> Plural. That's ridiculous. <laughs> and she comes out of the hallway, in the hallway. She goes, why'd you lie to me? I said, Margaret, I didn't lie to you. I'm a volunteer at this hospital. I just happen to also live here. <laughs> Anyway. So how did you convince her to oh, dude, be, I, with, be I, with you? She comes in one more day, like to the hospital to see her cousin. I stop her at the door. I'm getting, I'm like feeling myself. I'm like, Margaret, when I get out of here, can I take you to coffee? And she leans in and she goes, oh, honey, hell no. Yeah. And I was like, damn, but I'm persistent, right? So, yeah, yeah. so I, get, I, I get out of the psych ward. And I get my first 30 days probationary period done, which means in the, in the halfway home for the mentally ill, where you're living off $3 a day, you, you do the program to a T, they'll kick you out so fast, your head will spin. So I do my probationary period. I get to 30 days, which means I get my first weekend off. I call Margaret. I, I'd stolen her number from her cousin's phone. It was in the cubby hole. There was this no, guy there, really hates you. There was, no, really hated, there, was no, there was no phone access, thumb nonsense. Yeah, I yeah. just went in there, I got a number. So I called Margaret on Friday, and this is like the conversation. I was like, hi, Margaret, it's Kevin. She's like, yeah, Kevin. You know, I was like, Kevin Hines. She goes, uh, she didn't remember me. I was like, from the psych ward. And she goes, oh, hi, Kevin. How are you? Kevin, how did you get this phone number? And I was like, that's unimportant. Um, <laughs> Margaret, uh, it's Friday. I'd like to take you to dinner. And she goes, uh, oh, Kevin, I don't. And I was like, no, listen, I need this. I need one date. If you hate it, you never have to see me again. And she goes, oh, okay. And I show up at her apartment. I really, I really messed up. I showed up at Margaret's closer to the mic. Sorry. I sorry. I showed up at Margaret's apartment with a giant ski duffel bag of lots of my things. And she goes, What the hell's that? I said, Margaret, when you leave the halfway home on a Friday and you go out past 9 p.m., you made reservations at 9. You can't go back to the halfway home until Monday. <laughs> and she was like, Oh, hell no. She says that all the time. And I was like, Margaret, I will take this bag. I will lay on it as a pillow on those stairs. And I will sleep there tonight. We had to go on this date. I came all this way. And she goes, oh, God, fine. We go to this Italian joint called Cafe Sport in Little Italy. Did Northeast. you pay for it? No, <laughs> you don't get there. So I was going to say, you no, said you're living off $3 a $3 day. $3 a day. So, so no, I had no money. So, <laughs> so I was like, we go up to Cafe Sport, which is an old mob hangout. And it's very, very well, well, everyone knows that. So you go to Cafe Sport and you don't order at Cafe Sport. They look at you, they judge you, and they order for you. So it's these tiny tables. You can hear everyone's conversation verbatim. It's it's like really close quarters, elbows to elbows, tiny tables. So they order her an eggplant parmesan deal, fits on the table, but they order me a, a giant bed of spaghetti, a mountain of marinara sauce, and a huge uncracked lobster. Never cracked a lobster. It's like the most expensive thing on the menu, and I have no money. Yeah. And I'm freaking out because I've just bought myself 
my only good white shirt. <laughs> and you're about to eat spaghetti. At, at Old Navy on sale at the clearance rack for like $5. <laughs> and, I, and I'm freaking out and I don't know how to crack a lobster, but there's a, there's a votive with a can of plate and boiling butter. There's an oddly cut lemon wedge and, and, and there's a cracker. So I take the cracker on the tail. You remember this very vividly. No, very vividly. <laughs> I, do, I do my positive affirmations for, from, the, from the data. I was like, okay, Kevin, I believe in you. You can do this, Kevin, go. And I cracked the tail marinara sauce like all over. It was like Captain America's shield on his shirt. I'm freaking out. She thinks I'm a slob in the first five minutes. I'm, I'm go- but my brain stops. Goes, Kevin, do something classy right now. And I was like, what does that mean, Kevin? I was like, figure it out. I have inner dialogue. Okay, figure it out, man. So I go and I, I'm like, okay, I got this. I grab the lemon. I pick it up and I look at Margaret's eyes. And I just, I, was, I start to shake. And then I go like this. And I squoze the lemon harder than the lemon has ever been squoze. And I watch a stream of lemon juice fly directly across the table into her left eye. <laughs> Mascara is flying down her face. She looks oh, like the band kiss of the film The Crow. I'm freaking out and I'm freaking out. And then my brain goes, Kevin, do something classier now. And I'm like, didn't work the first time, man. And then I freak out and I go for the plate of boiling butter, like with full force. Yeah, it, two droplets of boiling butter fly across the table between her blouse under her chest and they burn her and she screams bloody murder. The whole restaurant stops. I'm a gentleman. I grab my napkin and I reach over and I'm doing this to Margaret right here (laughs) on a first date. And she goes, what are you doing? I said, Margaret, I have no idea what I'm doing. (laughs) Clearly. And she goes... The only two words you never want to hear in a first date in the first 10 minutes when you have not eaten your food. Check, please. I lost it. Oh, God. She walked a mile in front of me back to the apartment. I was like, we're not going to get married. We're not going to have the six kids, I imagine. <laughs> we're not going to have the dog named Max. He was a sharp pay, looked just like dad. <laughs> and we get to the apartment and she looks at the bag. She turns around. She goes, we're going to the roof. I was like, are you going to throw me off? <laughs> we get to the roof two yoga mats in a garden, we lay down. And she goes, <laughs> she, she she's laying there, awkward silence. And I was like, Mark, what the hell are we doing here? And she goes, Kevin, if all we do right now is stare at that full moon, ain't nothing else can go wrong. <laughs> Champion of dating. Right? Yeah. Come on. Sounds like it. That was it. I wish I could be that good. <laughs> so who I, paid for the I, I, dinner? So she did. Oh, don't, man. No, You're the worst don't, first don't, date ever. <laughs> don't tell people that. You ask a girl don't on a date people. and you make her pay. Meanwhile, you squeeze lemon juice in her eyes. <laughs> yes. And butter all over her chest. Boiling butter. My good. No wonder you like boiling water. <laughs> <laughs> I waited. I waited till our second date to tell her I loved her, though. You move quick. <laughs> I mean, and this is what she did. She goes like this. She's like at 10 and 2 on the uh, drive. In the, we're driving to most deaf concert. He didn't show up. So we're driving to most deaf concert that we didn't see. And, and, and she's driving. And I turned her. I couldn't wait. I was bursting. It seems like, Margaret, Margaret, I have to, I have to tell you something. She's like, yes, Kevin, what? Just, I'm driving. And I was like, no, Margaret, I, I, this is really important. It's, it's crucial. And she goes, what? And I said, I'm, I love you. And she was like this. She goes, um, uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you. You move quick. <laughs> anyway, she somewhere along the line fell in love with me too. So awesome, man! That's so great. That's yeah, great man. to hear. And I'm glad you're. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you guys met. I'm glad you're happy. I'm glad you're doing the thing. Yeah, man. The be here tomorrow. Be here tomorrow. You guys can check him out on YouTube, right? On Instagram, YouTube. Kevin Hines. Come backslash Kevin Hines. Bring it. You're spreading the positivity day in and day out. That's what I love to see. My motto is be positive, be happy, and be you. And that's exactly what Kevin Hines is doing. And that's exactly what you guys should do out there, guys, every single day. Be yourself. And no, no one could be as good as you as you. You know what I'm saying? That's what I like to see. Spreading the positivity with Kevin Hines. Be here tomorrow, guys. That's a, that's a wrap. Deuces. Oh, yeah.